back to the garage, everybody. This video is going to be a little different format than what I normally do because this is tutorial. I'm going to go through a lot of step by step with this to help you get into welding, specifically MIG welding. Now, I'm a big fan of this titanium Harbor Freight welder. No sponsorship or anything like that. I just really like Harbor Freight welders. This works really well for what I do. Now, there are other higher end that have extra features and stuff. Entry level, this is great, and that's what this video is for. I'm going to teach you the basics and entry level stuff of getting into MIG welding. I'm going to keep this as simple as I possibly can for you so that way you can start welding today or maybe after you get a few more things because when you go to buy a welder, there's a lot more that you need that will make your life that much easier or just need to get beginning. First things first, when you get a welder, you need to choose what kind of stuff you plan on welding. For me, I'll be doing a lot of car stuff. That dictates what size welder you're going to need for whatever you're going to be working on. I like to get stuff a little bigger so I can grow into it because my projects usually get bigger and bigger. Each time I do a new one, I take it more advanced. I like to constantly teach myself new things and that. And I hope you do too, to constantly grow and better myself and my skill set. So once you determine what size you want it, like this titanium 170 is great for working on cars because I could do up to quarter inch steel if I'm using solid core wire and not flux core. That's a whole nother thing. Like this welder came with two spools of wire, one solid core and one flux core. Now they both look the same and they are kind of similar. The main difference is one, you need to have a shielded gas or C25 gas bottle that you hook up in line or you use the flux core which has essentially the gas built into it. The, the flux inside shields your weld to keep it from getting very porous or full of tiny little holes. And that's the main difference between these two. I will nine times out of ten recommend solid core and get yourself a bottle of C25. It's very easy to get nowadays. You can go to places like Northern Tool and pick up a bottle of C25 gas. It's just a mix of gases and it shields your weld as you weld to keep impurities out of it, to keep from getting little holes or little imperfection in your weld. Imperfections cause cracks, cracks cause welds to fail, and you don't want that. With flux core, you're gonna have to do things a little differently. Flux core, when you weld, leaves a film or a scaling on top of the weld, and then you're gonna need something like this, which is a chipping hammer, or you may see them like this, come in a variety, where you have to chip away at that extra layer, then wire brush the extra covering off. I don't like doing that, it slows down the process, but depending on what your project is or what you plan on doing with it, it may be okay. It makes a welder a lot more portable because you don't need to have an extra tank to go with it, you can just pick it up and go. Now my setup I'm running today, I'm running C25 gas. I'm running this at 120 volts. I can run it at 220 as well with this particular welder, but I'm trying to set this up more like how you would at home because not everybody's going to have access to 220 voltage or have spent another $100, $200 for a cable to run to a 220 port for, like, say, your dryer, which is how I run mine inside my house, and run that cable out to my garage. That's a whole nother expense, whole nother thing that running at 120 will get the job done depending on what you're working on. I'm working on body panels on, say, my F100 back here. 120 volt, it's going to work fine. I can use a very heavy duty extension cord that I can just pick up locally from my Harbor Freight, or not Harbor Freight, or pick up locally from Lowe's or wherever. That will make my life easier and still draw enough amperage without causing any issues. As far as tool set you're going to need when you get into welding, right off the bat, gloves. A lot of different types of gloves out there. These are actual MIG gloves. These are heavy, they're thick, they're dense. When you put them on, there is not as much movement. You can still get some dexterity here, but it's very thick. It's, you don't feel much through these gloves, but they protect you from heat. These are a must, especially if you're welding in tight quarters. If you're welding up in a corner of something, then your hands can be real close to heat. All that heat's wrapped around. It will burn you very quickly. These work great. Now you do have another set. These are actually TIG gloves for TIG welding. They're not as thick. They're much thinner. You can see they fold over real easy. They work well for MIG welding 
too, but they're not as protected from the heat as the thicker ones. I recommend the thicker ones. Neither one are that expensive. Picking up a pair of each, depending on whatever you're currently working on. Like me working on this welding table, I can get away with these gloves with no problem because I'm in the open area. I'm inside a car or bent around a trailer frame or something of that nature. Then the thicker gloves are definitely going to be my friend. Other things you need to consider is you need to cover up when you're welding. My sandals are not welding sandals. This exposed skin is a problem with welding. Think of it like this. When you're welding, the bright light that is coming off the arc when you strike that arc is blinding your eyes. It's like a little mini sun in front of you. It's going to sunburn you very quickly. So even like this exposed skin right here, I have forgotten to cover this up and been sunburned in a little triangle on the center of my chest because I didn't bun this up. I had the helmet on, but this got sunburned really badly just from welding. It didn't take that much welding to achieve that. So beware, you need to cover up, you know, button up your shirts, don't wear anything nice, don't wear anything that's gonna melt. Your rings, necklaces, earrings, take them all off. Rings especially, this is a tungsten ring. If I'm welding and it becomes part of the ground when I'm welding, this is going to permanently attach itself to my finger. And with a tungsten ring, only way to get it off, cut your finger off. That's it, You're, it's an instant ER trip. Not worth it, take all your jewelry off. Watches, take them off too, especially like this guy, electronic watch. You're gonna fry this thing, cell phones, out of your pockets. It's all gotta go. You can't have it on you when you're welding. Things you can use to cover up, you can pick yourself up a set of welding sleeves. Picked these up from Harbor Freight years ago. Pretty sure they still have them. They'll cover up your arm, keep you from getting sunburned here. Or my personal favorite is just go ahead and get a welding jacket like this one here. Depending on how long you're welding, it depends if you really need to put it on or not. You want to follow OSHA reg, you're putting it on. But I've welded plenty in just t-shirt and shorts with no real problem. Biggest thing is that footwear is a big deal because the sparks go down. Everything multi-metal travels down. And the way you have a tendency to stand, your foot will go underneath it. It will go right on your foot. You'll probably see that today. All those clips will be at the end of the video. If you want to check the burns that I get, because most likely I'll get them because I just don't want to put shoes on and I'm being lazy about it. All right, now we're covered up, got proper attire. You need to be able to see what you're doing. You need a welding mask. Now, some of the welders come with this style mask. It's just a single shade. You can change these little inserts out. And you can see on these, it shows number 11, which is the shade number, depending on telling you how dark this is. Now, these are okay. They get the job done, but you have to hold it while you weld. That's kind of a pain in the butt. So I do prefer a nice electronic helmet. Now I did a review on this Yes Welder helmet. I love these guys, they work good, big viewing angle. Put a link below for that. I like the adjustability of these, don't run. This has its place too, but for 90% of the welding I'm gonna do, it's gonna win out every time. I can use it for TIG, I can use it for MIG, I can adjust the lightness and darkness and everything on it. It all works really well. Throw the miscellaneous things you need, like. This welding table, you don't need this welding table to do what you're doing, especially as a beginner. Now, this table works great. In the same video I do the, the review on the Yes Welding Helmet, this is in there as well. I talked about it. It works good. I'm really a big fan. You don't need this. You can weld two pieces of metal being held together by a clamp or a vise, sitting on the floor, as long as you use the ground, they're grounded properly, whatever. You don't need to have this. This makes my life easier for what I do. Your mileage may vary based off what kind of projects that you're going to be working on. Basic tools, some wire cutters. You can get MIG pliers. I don't know where mine went. They've gone MIA. So wire cutters to cut the MIG wire when you need to cut it. A pair of pliers for grabbing hot things or trimming wire as well. These do double up as a wire cutter as well. Some nice clamps. So these are for clamping all your stuff together to the table, piece of metal together, whatever. I like the ones with little flexible feet on them, depending on what you're working on. They sell very many varieties of these. This 
well. Another Harbor Freight Northern Tool. They all sell these things. No problem. They even have them at Lowe's and Home Depot. And the other must is going to be a grinder. You need a way to clean your metal. You need a way to clean your welds, to clean everything up. A grinder, four inch grinder, Harbor Freight as well. I've had this thing for years. I actually have like four different grinders because I have various different types of wheels I keep on them. One with cutoff wheels, some with wire wheels. But if you're using flux core, this is your best friend. Getting all that slag and stuff out of those welds, this is a great tool to have to put on your weld and just run it back and forth. Saves so much time. Grinders, definitely a huge, huge thing that you're going to need when you weld. They, you got to clean your metal. Clean, 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 clean. Prep is 90% of the weld. Just like painting, bodywork, anything else, your foundation needs to be strong and clean in order for you to build upon it. Without doing that, you're going to have problems. Of course, basic standard stuff as well. Some safety glasses, some earmuffs, that way I can quiet out with grinders. Whatever you need for stuff like that. This is pretty standard stuff in the garage. If you don't have these, you can, come on, really get... You can pick up a pair of these for cheap They're for a dollar at the parts store. Buy several sets so you can keep them all around the garage. Now that I cleared off the workspace here of all the extra tools I don't need for what I'm currently working on, cleaning your area is a must. Being aware of what's around you is a big deal. You don't want any gas cans, any excess old oil floating around, paper towels. Things are going to catch on fire while you're welding. This can get out of control fast. I do recommend having a fire extinguisher nearby. I keep one on the top of my toolbox at all times. Because I do a lot of welding and I have set stuff on fire pretty regularly in here. So I don't want to burn my house down. Kind of a big deal. Be aware. Something to keep a look at. Old rags, soaking oil, puddles of oil from a leaky car. All things that can ignite very easily. So before we get to welding, we need to prep our metal. Now, everybody's going to want to take a piece of metal and just start welding on it immediately. Eh, stop right there. We need to prep this before we begin. Yes, it's clean. Not a lot of rust on it. But this coloring, it's not shiny. It's got a blue scaling on to keep it from rusting. You got to take that scaling off to keep your weld clean, to keep your weld from being contaminated. Contamination in your weld causes cracks, which causes it to break and fail. And they're going to fail at the worst time possible. When you're driving on the road and you weld something on the trailer, it's going to snap. It's got to be clean. So before we even turn the welder on, we got to clean this out. Now for me, I have this clamp holding this piece down here. You can use a pair of clamps and clamp this to the table itself. However you want to do it, it's easy. Then take your grinder and just take that scaling off. You're going to need something more than the wire wheel for this. You can use sandpaper discs or just me, I always use a grinding wheel. Depends on what you're working on. If you're working on really thin metal, sandpaper disc. This is just a blade from an edger that a buddy just happened to be throwing away. So that's where I got this scrap metal from. You can get scrap metal from a lot of places. Most stuff you have around the house. I keep a bit of it so that way I have for stuff for practicing welding and stuff. Go ahead and prep this out and then we'll get into actual laying our first piece. I'm not taking a lot off. I'm just skimming it over to get rid of the excess coat. I'm not putting pressure, I'm just letting the grinder do the work, guiding it over. Careful, it will be hot when you're done grinding, so don't be just grabbing right off the bat without checking it first. Shiny, cover it up. All that stuff there, that's imperfections. You want shiny, that's what you need to prep your metal. It needs to look clean. Prep is 90% of your welding. It needs to be clean. I can't emphasize this enough. The better you prep, the better your welds are going to be, the stronger they're going to hold. It is a must. If you skip these steps, don't even bother. Get rid of your welder. You shouldn't be doing this. This is important. This is the most important step of welding. In one side, because I'm only going to be running beads on this side. I'm not welding this particular piece together for what I'm doing with you guys right now. All right, let's move on to setting up the welder itself. I am running this with gas. I'm not running flux core. I'm using gas. That's what it's set up for right now. Now, basic ways of setting this machine, just follow the instructions that are on it. There's a nice chart on the inside of your welder that explains you how to set up based off what you have. Follow the chart. 
Now it is just a guideline. It will get you really close or sometimes perfectly on what you need based off what you're welding on. But you're gonna have to tweak it a little bit, but you'll understand that more as you weld and you see and you feel what you're doing. There's a lot of feel and see on what you're doing with welding. This is an art form. It takes practice, takes time to learn. Some people get it outright just from the beginning. You're not gonna get that right off the bat. You're not gonna get those dimes that you see on those Instagram or wherever you, people post welding photos. They expect perfection every time. They're wrong. I wish I could weld that way every time too, but I can't. I think I'm a good welder, not that good of a welder. The charts do a really good job. They've really done a good job narrowing down how close you need to be to start laying down your beads and putting down good, strong welds. Follow it. Set the machine up the way it says. It's okay. Once you get better, you will know when you need to tweak things in order to really dial in your welds exactly the way you weld. Everybody welds it a little different. We'll get more into that in a minute. Let's get the machine all set up. Now that we got the machine all set up, we need to take our gun and show you guys what's going on here. This is where your wire feeds are going to come out. When you run your wire through, you're going to need to unscrew this tip right here. You're going to need to unscrew the tip right here to feed your wire. It'd be a lot easier than trying to fish it through that tiny little hole that's in there. A pair of pliers on this will put it right off. Mine's already done. This is your nozzle which helps funnel the gas from the tank through here to shield your weld. That's what all this gun is for. To make weld, simply pull the trigger. Once it hits something, the once it hits your metal, it's gonna spark as long as you've grounded your metal. For me, I've taken my ground and attached it to my table. Now if I don't have a ground and I try to weld, it doesn't do anything. It's not going to spark because I haven't ground. I have completed the circuit. Very important. For me, in this case, I can ground to my table because this is a metal table with the metal piece sitting on top. Now I can start welding. To start with the very basics of welding, we're going to lay a bead of weld. Now all we're going to be doing, say this is the, way, the tip of the gun. This is where the wire feed comes out. We're going to take the gun and we're just going to strike the arc, pull the trigger, and just pull backwards. Make like two inch long bead of weld. You're going to see it bead up. Whatever comes out, just let it happen. And then we're going to examine that. From there, we're going to go back the other way and we're going to push the weld and go the other direction. This is your basic welding technique. Very, very entry level. This is where you need to start. Don't get two pieces of metal and try to weld them together in the beginning. Start this way. Helps you get to know the machine and understand what's going on. Once you pull the trigger on the gun, you're going to see it start to form a little molten puddle of metal. You'll see it looks like a little lake, a little tiny lake that you're going to, that's what you're controlling. You're moving that around, that's where the weld's going to follow. If the pool gets too big, you're running too hot. If the pool get, it doesn't show up or it's itty bitty, you don't have enough power. You need to crank it up. So those are things to kind of look out for. But right now, let's just pull the trigger, get started, and see what the machine does, what your results come out with. All right, we're all set to weld. Helmet, gloves, nice seated position. Now, you can do the standing, seated. I find it easier when you're learning to be seated. That way you can kind of prop yourself on the table and get the angle you need here a little bit. Like I said, sleeves or something like that is definitely a way to go. Right now my gun has a very long lead coming out. That's not okay, we need to shorten that up. Now you're not gonna cut it all the way to the very tip. Leave a little bit about a quarter of an inch out, snip that off, and that's gonna, the wire is gonna feed through this gun as we weld. When you weld, get comfortable. Like you can stand and get over it, Whatever you find easier. Biggest thing I find is keep your elbow up. A lot of people like to drop the elbow and then it messes up your angle. You want to keep the angle at about a 45 degree angle pulling this way. Same thing when you go in the other direction, going that way. You're going to angle it and you're going to keep about a quarter inch off. You'll see when you pull further away, the arc is going to start going erratic everywhere. You're going to get a little closer, but you don't want to touch it into the puddle either. There's a fine line there where you keep the consistent distance with the consistent speed of the pull. Don't go, you're going way too fast. 
So you just get it nice and easy, and you pull the string back. So if you see the puddle getting too wide, go up a little faster. It'll help disperse the heat a little bit. If your arc starts going erratic, get a little bit closer. This is a very small movement. You're not making big movements. Arm up. Said, you can rest your arm here, but be careful because stuff will hit you here. And he's going to pull back. Pull the trigger, pull back. All right, let's go ahead and do this. All right, that was just a pull. Went one direction. Don't be touching it immediately. It's... Not okay. Let's see what happened. All right, you see this brown stuff on the outer edge here? That's going to be from the shielding gas. That's what that is. Now, the well, you can kind of see that row of dimes like they talk about where you get the individual little ripples in each one of those. But the problem with the well, you can see, is it's sitting on top. It's not down into the metal. So it wasn't hot enough for this piece of metal. Play with it and make this work on this. Plus I got some heat in the metal now, so it should help get to temperature. So now that this is sitting on top, we know I need more power. So I cranked up the power on the welder itself to see what it does now. This time we're gonna take, instead of just pulling the puddle, we're gonna push it the other direction. Remember, keep your arm up. Keep that angle good. Keep that quarter inch distance. When you weld it, did you hear it now when I weld it? It's something more like a frying egg, more consistent noise when you go. That's part of the way you know that you're getting the right wire speed, the right temperature. It should sound like a frying egg or cooking bacon. That sizzle is the noise you're going to hear when you weld. I don't know how well the microphones are going to pick up that noise, but hopefully it did a good job for you guys so you can hear what I'm talking about. It needs to sound consistent. If it's getting erratic and sputtery, there's a problem. You need to stop. Play with the machine. Adjust your angle. Maybe your, your weld is, the surface isn't good. So a lot of different variables you need to play with there. Now that we've done that, let's go ahead and take a look at the weld I laid down. This will be the second weld. You can see it's kind of got the ripples going on still in that, for that weld. You can see this right there, that brown is going to be the gas, the shield gas, which is fine. That's normal with this. I can just take a wire brush and clean that off. The bluing you can see is starting to show more around the edges, which is a good indicator. You're starting to get enough heat into this. It's still sitting on top a little bit, so it's not that great. It still needs to be turned up a little bit for the thickness of the metal I have here. But it's definitely better than what this is. You can see how this piece is sitting on top, and this one is starting to sink down more into the well the metal itself and that's what we're looking for we need it to start melting itself into the metal all right so all the welds i did on that piece of metal did not penetrate why the machine did not have enough oomph to do it it didn't have enough voltage because i'm running it at 120 volts if i'm running at 220 that would have worked on that piece of metal just fine that's pretty thick that's three sixteenth inch steel now, if you don't know how to measure the metal and how thick they are, I'm pretty good about doing it by eye. I've been doing it for a while. But they sell little gauges. I have a link below as well for one. that you can just take them, slip the piece over, and tell what it is. Now we're going to do it again, laying a bead on this little thin guy. I went ahead and reset the, the welder to a thinner metal setting. That way I can get a good penetration on this piece of metal. I want to show you guys what a good, solid weld looks like. Stuff sitting on top doesn't cut it. You need to get the penetration in there. So we're going to do the same as usual. Glove up. Get a nice angle on it. This is a little bit too long, so I'm going to go ahead and trim it down. If you trim it too short, just pull the trigger. It'll stand out a little bit. It's fine. All right. We're going to do, this. We're going to do the same thing as before. We're just going to pull the stringer back, check it out, and if that's good, we're going to do the stringer and pull it forward and push it the welder. Now that 
already came out a whole lot better because the machine wasn't struggling trying to weld through that thicker metal with the settings it had on it. This is more along the lines of what you should be welding with something at 120, something really thin. The thicker you get, the harder it's going to be, the more power you need. All right, so you can look at this. You can see how on the top, it's over here where I started. It's sitting really high. It's not setting down in there. But you see how it starts to flatten out the further I go? That's because this piece of metal is getting really hot. It's a really small piece of metal. It, you can't weld on it too much before the pellet just gets away from you and just goes bleh. And just, just turns into a freaking puddle of nothing. And just washes away or blows a hole through this piece of metal. If you get it too hot, you're going to turn this thing into Swiss cheese. It's just going to put a hole right through the metal. And then you're going to have to fill it back up. That's not okay. So in the center here, we're doing okay. We're starting to get that attachment that we want. You can see how like right there, it starts to kind of cool out a little more. That's what we're looking for. Right here, it started to cool off a little bit because I went a little faster. And you can see how it starts to meld into that metal. It's not just sitting on top like you see over here where it's, it's not adhered to it. It's just sitting on top of it. It's starting to see, actually bind itself together here. Now we flip this over. You can see how it looks like I welded on both sides when I didn't. I only welded on the one side. That means I'm getting good penetration. Maybe a little too much, but overall, that's showing I'm getting deep into metal. It's melting it down enough without blowing a hole in itself. On this particular piece, we pulled the puddle. Now we're going to push the puddle. Hope you guys are starting to see what I'm talking about. Where you see that little puddle of molten metal in there. And that's what you're walking. That's what you're moving. That's what you're controlling. You need to keep it consistent and moving in. That's what you're trying to get to spread into the metal itself. To adhere the pieces together. Now, like I said, we're just running beads right now. Understanding the machine. Understanding how everything works. I've got a couple more pieces. We'll do a couple of joints together. And just demonstrate some more off of you. But let's go ahead and trim up this excess wire I got. Arm up. Just put it a little further away from me. All right, now we're just going to push. Instead of pulling it like we did, we're going to push it this way. So that's our new one. You can see how it's kind of sitting on top there. And then it's starting to meld into it there on the end. So that's like I welded on both sides again when I didn't. I only put on one side. That means I'm getting the right amount of penetration because it's starting to come through on both sides. You're going to continue to do beads as many times as you need to. Now, be careful not to overheat the metal. When you get it too hot, it's just going to blow a hole. You're just going to see a hole. And the, well, the wire feed is going to keep going through the hole, and you're going to stop welding. it. That's okay. It's going to happen. Let it happen. Learn from it. Understand that you're controlling heat when you're doing this. Where the heat goes, how much heat goes in there. When you talk about cars and talk about overheating a panel, that's stuff like that. Where you get the panel too hot, the panel warps. Things to take into consideration when you're starting out welding. Now, you got a couple different options too. Like this is running beads. You got a couple different joint options to work on. You got your lap joint, your two pieces that slay over each other. That's your basic lap joint. That's your easiest joint to weld. Doesn't take any extra heat, any extra thing. The biggest thing is you need to understand how you need to weld it. You can pull a stringer on this if, if you're good. You can just put it in there and just pull a string. But most people are going to zigzag. They're going to go from here to here and just zigzag back and forth. So you're going to see a pattern, this on there, as they weld from side to side on each one. Getting a little bit of the top piece of metal, you know, grabbing a little from the top, a little from the bottom, moving the puddle back and forth. Some people will end up doing like a U and then double back, then double back and double back. Some will do a circle or E's I've heard this called before as well. It depends on exactly your style and what's going to work for you. So same thing, you got your lap joints. This is just your basic over top. You got your butt joint where they meet up together, and then you got your T joint. Those are your main joints you're going to be welding with. Nine, you know, T joint where you just 
well than you stand here and keep it upright. Those are your basic joints that you're going to be welding with. We're going to go and start with the basic lap joint. You got to make sure your metal is flush. Right now, like my metal does not sit flush with each other. Here's like flat, smaller of a gap there, and that's what we're looking for. Less gap, the better with this particular joint. Now we're going to tack this together. Tack is simple. You're going to aim the trigger at it. You're going to want to hold it down. I'm just going to use these pliers. Point it at an angle and pull the trigger. I'm not going to do it without the helmet. <laughs> so you see people, they'll tack stuff together. They'll just close their eyes, put it there, pull the trigger. Good enough. But really, you need to put the helmet on and see what you're doing. That way you get a good, strong tack. That way, whatever you're welding doesn't come apart when you're working on it. My first tack will pop off because it's not really adhered to anything on it. It's just kind of sitting on top. The second one is actually grabbing into the metal like it's supposed to. Now, I still have a little bit of a gap here, so I need to tap that down. And I, as I tapped it to help straighten it out, you can see my tack popped off. There's a hole there. Now it's not, now it's just flapping in the wind. So that was a problem, but it's held together. So we're going to go ahead and send it. My lap joint, I'm going to go ahead and just zigzag left and right, left and right. Now you can do this pushing or pulling, doesn't matter. I find it easier to pull the weld towards me as I'm welding. I feel like I get more consistent welds that way. That's how I operate. You're going to have to play with this and find out how well it works for you, which way or the other. And that's fine. That's part of welding. So I'm going to leave the settings of the machine the same for this particular joint only because this top piece of metal is going to get a lot of heat because heat travels up it's going to soak into it and if i'm not careful i'm going to end up just turning the top piece of metal into a blob of nothing and leave a massive hole i don't want to do that i want to control it so i'm going to set it up make sure my arm's up and i'm just going to zigzag left and right left and right so all i'm going to do Grab a little bit of the top piece of metal, work that puddle down to the bottom of the metal. Take that puddle, work it up to the top. You'll see it. It takes a little bit to get used to see the puddle, but you'll see how the puddle moves back and forth as you do. Nice and easy movement. You're not doing any big arm movements or anything. Just, you, can do wrist, you can do arm if you need to, but I find just a little bit of wrist flick is all it takes. to stop because I started to lose it. The top piece of metal started to just drip away before I even got the welder to it. it just The parts I had just started losing. So I, just, I stopped, let it cool off a minute, take a look. Let's see what how I did for everything else. The heat started getting away from me a little bit. From the back side, it's kind of getting there. Not quite enough penetration, but it, it, it's okay. We're learning. This is how we get there. We had to practice. Oh, we're getting somewhere. Turn the wire speed down a little bit. It helps dial my weld in better. Help give me more consistency. Now, when you're welding, you need to take your time. Pause. You move to the right, pause a little bit. Left, pause. Right, pause. Don't just consistently move. Let it saturate with the heat a little bit and then move it. You'll start to understand as you weld and you start to see the melt. It start melting away and we need to speed up, slow down on that. Flaking off the back because I didn't take any of the paint or crud off the back of it, so I just left it. 
start to see some penetration on the back side there. Weld up front. So now we're going to weld the butt joint. Butt joint, again, is just... Boom, that's it. Two pieces together. But it's together. Now, depending on thick your metal is, you might need to cut a little chamfer in there, a little wedge shape to help get the penetration through. But this is thin enough, I should not have to do that. Again, you want to keep your gaps to a minimal. You don't want any big gaps, so both pieces laying flat. And that's it. And we're going to go ahead and tack these together. text that way it holds itself together. My gap is a little big here. I did that on purpose. I got some tight, I got some wide. I want to show you guys to see how the weld reacts to that. This one I'm going to do circles. I'm going to pull the trigger. I'm just going to circle around more ease. I'm going to make ease or circles, however you want to call it, as I do this one. see in the beginning where the weld sort of looks pretty good, but then it gets all holy and all messed up in the center there. You can see it on the back side. See, see right through this thing. That's where my gap was too big. With that gap in between, I had nothing to fill it with. I didn't have enough welding cable or welding wire to fill that. You can't fill that gap. It should have been a tighter gap. Now, I can run another bead right over this and fill that in, but that's not the point. You should do it. The less heat you put into the metal, the better. The more heat, the more brittle it becomes. That becomes a problem, especially depending on your pro your project. You're welding on the frame of a car. You don't want to put that much heat in there. You can run it to warp, it becomes brittle, it breaks. That's not okay. You want to keep the strength and integrity of the metal as strong as possible. One pass, if that's what you can do, especially on thin metal. Thin metal, you too many passes, this thing warps. And if you have a roof panel or door panel, it's done. And now you get to fill it with Bondo and putty. It causes way more work later, a lot more grinding. But you can see in the beginning where it starts to look good. And then you start to see on the back side where I'm filling in that gap from both pieces of metal. Welding 101. Now I could go into a T-join, I can go into pipe stuff, but we're going to stop here. This is a good entry level point to stop at. Learn how to do the beads. Learn how to read the weld. If it's getting too hot, if it's getting too cold, is it getting enough penetration? Blow a hole. Crank up the heat. Blow a hole in the metal. Try it. Play with it to see how it looks. There's a lot of different techniques to go with this. I just taught you the basics to get into this. You guys want to see another video of this more advanced techniques, get into pipe welding, exhaust welding, put in the comments below. I'll be sure to do that for you guys at a future date. I got a few other projects I'm going to be working on for video wise coming up soon. So that video will be off for a while, but start here, grow with it, learn it, take your time, get some scrap metal, the scrap metal, you can find anywhere. You can take old pieces. Just make sure your metal isn't too thin. The thinner it is, the harder it is to weld. Now don't get me wrong. The thinner, if you can learn how to weld thin metal, you're great. Thick metal will be super easy for you. Thanks for watching, guys. Hope you learned something. Be sure to give a thumbs up if you liked the video. Thanks for, until next time, peace. Go work on your projects. I didn't burn my feet at all. Not a single burn. No, really, you should wear sneakers when you do this, or work boots, some sort. Sandals is not ideal. If you ever had a piece of multi-metal drop from a weld on your shoe, we're going to hold through the shoe, bolt it through the sock, and hit the top of your foot, it feels like it's literally burning a hole through your foot. It is the most painful thing. Wear proper footwear. Joking, serious, seriousness, real talk. I get away with this.
because I have a clue of how I'm doing things. I have a nice solid table to keep from killing my feet. You welding on the vice? It's a different story. <laughs> yeah, trust me. Different story, even with shoes on. But, yeah. Later. <laughs>